Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. 2024 marks 80 years since the founding of the Liberal Party of Australia. The party is an enduring legacy of Robert Menzies and others. Today's episode of Afternoon Light forms part of a special 10-part series to commemorate this 80th anniversary. Each of the 10 episodes will feature an author from our upcoming book on the founding of the Liberal Party, Unity in Autonomy. The book will be available from Connor Court and the Robert Menzies Institute's website in October this year. Geographically distant and vast, it's no surprise that Western Australia developed its own unique political culture. Much of the early 20th century was marked by secessionist moves and the dominance of the WA Labor Party. Joining me to discuss the establishment of the Western Australian Liberal Party, though, is historian Dr Sherry Sufi. Welcome to Afternoon Light, Sherry. G'day, Georgie, and welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Great to speak to, I think, our first guest from Perth, although forgive me if I'm forgetting a past Perth guest, but I don't feel like we've had a guest from Perth before, so that is very no, Another reason to seed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the secessionist movement and moves are such a, a strong feature of this story and I guess an ongoing discussion too with all the way that Western Australia dealt with COVID and really cut itself off from the rest of Australia. So I'm looking forward to getting into that discussion because as someone from the east (laughs) I've always thought why would you want to secede leave us secede from us but there's obviously good arguments because it's it's always got a little bit of popularity doesn't it indeed it all comes down to that very unique mindset that we have in WA rightly or wrongly but which I'm sure we'll all get in due time yeah so Sherry I think what's important to start a discussion on Western Australian politics and of course the establishment of the Liberal Party in Western Australia what was going on pre-Federation in Western Australia? Because it took Western Australia a while to get democracy and self-government, didn't it? It did indeed. So uh, just by way of context, obviously, I won't cover the Dutch period when the Dutch explorers were here because our system's obviously based on the culture and politics that originated in the British Isles. So Captain Cook obviously claimed the island continent in 1770. His first fleet arrives in 1788. And the bulk of the focus of British settlement was centred around the East Coast for whatever reason. That's just where they were. Western Australia does not come into the picture until 1829. And initially, it didn't even start out as a penal colony. In fact, from 1829 till 1850, it wasn't a penal colony. It becomes one in 1850. And then shortly thereafter, only after about 18 years, we abolished convict transportation, the last ship arriving at Freo in 1868. So because WA was slower in playing catch up with the rest of the states, which had a much more developed infrastructure, I suppose, in New South Wales and Victoria in particular, that had the gold rush, for example, by the mid-1800s, at a time where WA was only just starting to arrive at the crease, if you will. So whereas other states started to gain political autonomy as part of a gradual package towards eventual autonomy as early as the 1850s, WA doesn't get its independence, if you will, to put it loosely, until 1890. But it is all very interesting because we were late in coming to the party and then when we did, we carried this distinct mentality that we're geographically so far away from the rest of the country. And then add to that the fact that WA, the founding pioneers were consciously aware that we are quite a resourceful state and there was always this fear that the other states that are so far away were just going to rob us of our resources. And you'd find that sentiment, rightly or wrongly, still occasionally makes its way into contemporary issues the way we talk about this GST problem that's been ongoing for the past decade plus. (laughs) So if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting. At first, WA wasn't even interested in joining the federation discussions, was it? Because it had just got its own self-government. I thought the federation, the Commonwealth, would basically mean They were ruled from Britain until 1890 and then suddenly they'd be ruled from Canberra or Melbourne as it was at the beginning, but the Commonwealth would sort of take over WA and they'd lose their hard-fought independence. 
Exactly. So WA obviously had those fears very early on. And much of the debates that went on during the 1890s, you would get the impression from looking at the records that there was a big reluctance to join the Federation. But the opinions were always split. I think sometimes what ends up happening is a lot of contemporary commentators look at records from back then and whether, I don't know, based on their personal preference or whatever, if they lean more towards secession, then they'll try and argue that people in the 1890s were lent more towards secession or if people who are anti-secession will try to frame the argument differently and say that the issue wasn't so much the Commonwealth itself, but more so Eastern state. And I'll probably lean towards that category as well. I understand a secessionist argument, but I think a major concern was that a lot of WA's resources would be channeled back to the Commonwealth and then redistributed in other states that had nothing to do with it. But it is interesting because before the Federation, despite that reluctance that I acknowledge existed at the time, WA did vote to join the Federation in the end. So we were part of the Federation. But I guess on an intellectual level, on a philosophical level, the temptation to just go your own way has always been there. It's very difficult to measure the size of what that looks like. Now, obviously, we can get into the 1933 referendum, which passed but didn't pass at the same time. And even in contemporary times, there was a move to go our own way around 2017 with what's called the Wagsit movement inspired by Brexit in the UK. I don't know whether you guys heard about that over East, but to sum this up, look, the sentiment exists, but it's very difficult to gauge exactly how popular it really is. Well, we'll get on to the 1933 referendum in a bit, but tell me about political parties developing in that very early 20th century in Western Australia. Because the Labor Party does quite a bit better, doesn't it, than the centre-right or right-leaning parties, the non-Labor side. Yeah, so because they find their origins out of the unionist movements, they were organising themselves as early as the middle half of the 1800s. And in Western Australia, the Labor Party registered itself in 1899 at a time when the centre-right wasn't really organised. I mean, we'd operated a fully functional local parliament for the entire decade from 1890 to pretty much 1901, with Sir John Forrest being the main premier. And then there was this realisation by about 1905 that there needed to be an opposition to this socialist presence in our parliaments, but still nothing quite like the Liberal Party as we understand it today emerged. And it was a very, very interesting landscape that we ended up with. Yeah, so there's this party called the Ministerial Party that develops at that time, doesn't it, which I guess becomes the Liberal Party eventually in one way or the other. (laughs) Yes, correct. And in 1901, there was three changes of premiers in a loose Liberals versus Conservative kind of a contest, if you will. So, Sherry, the Country Party is quite important in the story of the development of right-leaning politics in Western Australia. And it's established very early on in 1913 and becomes the biggest centre-right party. Can you talk about the importance of the country party in those early years of 20th century Western Australian politics? Because I guess this is going to frame how then the Liberal Party is established a few decades later. Yeah, absolutely. So the country party has a pretty interesting story. It starts out in 1913. It was actually the first country party in Australia. The Country Party emerged as a response to the frustrations of small wheat belt farmers and some conservative rural ex-liberals who felt that the existing political parties weren't really representing their interests. In 1914, coinciding with the start of the First World War, the Country Party made a big splash by winning a block of rural seats and they sort of did this mainly at the expense of the Liberals. This early success also gave the Country Party a real sense of momentum What's really interesting, though, is how the Country Party had positioned itself in relation to the other political forces of the time in 1915, when the Labor government under John Scadden lost its majority for a while. And the Country Party didn't just sit back. They acted as a bit of a third force, giving conditional support to Labor, which showed that the Country Party was willing to be flexible and pragmatic in its approach, which I guess helped it carve out a niche for itself in WA politics. So 
But what about the importance of the nationalists here, the nationalist party? Because obviously the country party is focused on the regional seats, not so much on metropolitan Perth. Did it mean that you had a real country party, nationalist party divide between the regions and Perth? Yeah, so from about 1917 onwards, the country party often operated in coalition with the nationalists. Although there was a significant split in 1923 between those who wanted to maintain the coalition and those who felt the country party should have its own distinct identity. But this split didn't last long. And by the mid 1920s, the country party was functioning as a conventional anti labour rural party. And at the federal level, there were joint nationalist country party WA Senate tickets from early as 1925. And federal WA country MPs were also part of the coalition. And I believe in 1930, Mitchell formed a coalition ministry with the country party leader, Charles Latham, choosing his party as ministers. And Latham became opposition leader in 1933 after the nationalists were reduced to a third party status. And did that mean that the nationalists very much were just the Perth party? I mean, was there a sense that they really couldn't go outside of Perth? And did that have particular consequences for their viability? Yes and no, I suppose. The way I'd look at that is that nationalists, while it's probably not true to describe the nationalists as a merely metropolitan party, their seats from 1933 to 1947 were generally confined to the city in the southwest. An electoral system it was unchanged since 1930, gave major weighting to the mining seats somewhere up around the centre in the north from 33 to 47. And they were generally confined to the city in the southwest. The third party status in opposition was the obvious consequence, even though WA federal elections showed that the nationalist vote was stronger than the country party. And this sort of helps us explain why Sir David Brand's 1945 capture of Greenough and the Wheat Belt was able to happen. So, which was the first time that the Liberal Party, as we know it, ever won a seat anywhere in the country. Right. Yeah. So, they certainly were the origins of some spread from the metropolitan areas, but it was it was certainly hard to fight the might of the country party or at least compete in a friendly way in the early stages. Tell me about how the conservative forces in WA got involved in the secessionist movement, though, because that's quite interesting. It doesn't, from over east, seem to be a left-right issue, but it was a conservative cause in the 1930s, wasn't it? Yeah, you could look at it that way. It's an interesting period. We're talking here right in the middle of the Great Depression. I guess it was as much a local problem as it was a global one across the Anglosphere and the other parts of the industrialised world. And in WA, we held a referendum in 1933 on secession and 68% of voters supported leaving the Commonwealth. I mean, it sounds like a pretty huge number. but It does. Here's it's quite troubling. It gets, <laughs> it's troubling, but here's where it gets a bit strange because at the same time, those very same voters elected a non-secessionist Labor government. So, you know, what does that tell us? I mean, this goes to the point I was making earlier on that the secessionist sentiment has always existed in the intellectual echelons of WA elites, but it's very difficult to measure how mainstream it really is. And often people in WA have done paradoxical things. And that's what 1933, that, that's what sort of the 30s decade was about. So I think what it suggests is that the people in WA were clearly frustrated with how they were being treated by the Commonwealth and they weren't actually that serious about going it alone. I suppose that's the view I take as a proud Australian first and a proud West Australian second. The secession vote was more of a protest in a way of saying that they were fed up rather than a real committed push for independence. And probably worth noting that the Dominion League, which was the main group pushing for secession, wasn't really deterred by this mixed message. They sent a delegation to London to try and make secession happen, right? Because you didn't just need I mean, you have to, in order to secede, you have to amend the constitution and you needed the approval, the tick of approval from Britain at the time. So they sent a delegation to London to try and make it happen. But then they ran into some pretty big roadblocks. First off, they didn't have the backing of the WA government, which is a major problem. Secondly, the British government after the 1931 statute of Westminster couldn't just step in and override the Australian constitution. 
So the constitution required a national referendum for a state to secede so the British government's hands were tied. And so we could say that the secessionist movement essentially hit a brick wall pretty quickly and the whole thing kind of just fizzled out. But like I say, it still resurfaces from time to time. Does it have a partisan flavour to this day or is it just a WA state pride issue irrespective of whether you fall left or right? It's an interesting question and I've often wondered that myself. I mean, if you look back at the politics in WA around COVID or post-COVID, the former Premier Mark McGowan often led the charge in talking up almost quasi-secessionist sounding sentiment that the, during the time when WA had its infamous hard border. Infamous or famous, depending on which way you look at it, it was probably infamous to us, but famous to the people who voted in McGowan at the last election. Which is an overwhelming he, majority of Western Australians, I guess. Well, 100%, and it reduced the party to two out of 59 seats in the lower house, something that we're hoping to fix at the next election on the 8th of March, fingers crossed, 2025. But look, to answer your question more directly, I think that secessionist sentiment exists across the divide, definitely. And COVID probably provided an opportunity for some Labor front benches to join in on the rhetoric. But I've never thought that it's anything that's, that's ever going to transpire. Not only is it constitutionally impossible, I think it's also culturally, it just wouldn't work. We love Shane Warne too much to actually secede. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the GST carve up these days seems pretty unfairly skewed towards WA. So perhaps you'd get all the other states on board, Sherry. I wouldn't be so negative about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's plenty We'd of work miss left. your royalties, though. We'd miss the mining royalties. <laughs> Tell me, though, Sherry, this secessionist campaign in the 1930s, how did this inspire future would-be Liberal politicians to get into politics? Because they were it was activating a whole kind of generation of people, wasn't it? It was, and the main person, I guess, was Keith Watson, an activist in the Dominion League. They were very active in promoting those sentiments and also a very big advocate of free enterprise and deregulation. And I guess sometimes these are the sorts of paradoxes we run into in politics that you've got to balance out everything. If you're a radical federalist, then essentially what you're saying is that all the states should have maximum autonomy to choose their own political destiny and choose to do whatever they wish to do with their own resources with minimum Commonwealth intervention. But then at the same time, if you have too much federalism, then you could be left defenceless in the event of military escalation. So you need some sort of a federal structure to act as an, a protective umbrella. And it's been a challenge for WA and its founding pioneers and leaders to work out what the appropriate level of centralism versus federalism really is. And that was the case during the 30s and 40s, and it still does remain the case to date. Something that's a real feature of WA politics and its impact on the federal sphere, of course, is the elevation of women into parliament. And WA is a trailblazer here. Can you tell me about that? Certainly. So this is something WA can really be proud of, being ahead of the curve, as far as I can see, when it came to promoting women to parliament. And I suspect there's probably a few reasons for that. First off, I would say women in WA got the right to vote pretty early on in 1899, just a year after South Australia. And this hadn't happened at the federal level until 1902, something I've written about in my recent book as well. This was partly because the government wanted to counterbalance the influence of a male-dominated sort of a culture that had developed during the gold rush and the gold fields. And it also reflected a broader open-mindedness in the state's political culture, even in a predominantly conservative parliament. Now, the fact that WA was willing to grant women the vote at a time when the rest of the country was still debating the issue probably says a lot about the fact that we were quite progressive on that front. Now, because WA women got the vote early, they didn't have to spend years fighting for it uh, as suffragists in other jurisdictions had had to do, not just here, but even right across the Anglosphere in America and Britain and so forth, where it took much longer. So I suppose this created a very woman-friendly environment, an environment that encouraged women to get involved right Sherry, from the very... Sherry, is yep. there a reason for that, do you think? Is it because of the sort of scarcity of people? So there was a sense that, well, we're sparsely populated, we're a huge geographical area, so perhaps giving the 50% of the population a go might actually 
<laughs> being the use so. of human capital? <laughs> I should hope so. I actually haven't looked at the gender breakdown of the population in that period, but it'd be a very interesting research exercise to look at that. I suspect, though, definitely, I mean, I have looked at the, the archives from the mid-1800s of sociologically surveying the relationship between males and females is because, see, you ask an interesting question, actually, I think a lot of it was was born out of necessity. We probably can say that because in Scotland, England, Ireland and, and Wales, where the ancestors of majority of modern day Australians come from, you had societies that went back thousands of years for, to Stonehenge and, and the Battle of Hastings and all of that. You have their descendants essentially dumped onto the other side of this planet on this barren island you couldn't survive if you were to confine yourself to being a male-dominated society. You had to, at some point, by necessity, allow women to come out and help participate in every sector of society. And because, I suppose, WA was not only the most isolated state in Australia, but also one of the most isolated places in the world, I suppose you're right in the sense that we couldn't afford to keep women confined to jobs that were more considered traditional at the time. So I, I guess, yes, that probably did lead to an environment where women didn't have to spend years fighting for their rights as they did have to do in other states. And so we had the Women's Service Guild and the Australian Women's National League, which were quite instrumental in mobilising women and pushing for their involvement in politics. And look, and these organisations weren't just about getting women into parliament, they were about shaping the political culture of WA as a whole. And so it's really no surprises that we produce quite a few pioneering West Australian females. I can give you a few examples of those. Edith Cowan, and there's a university named after her, it was the first woman elected to any Australian parliament in 1921. She was an absolute trailblazer and her success opened the door for inspiring other women to follow. And Sherry, uh, she was a candidate for the Nationalist Party, wasn't she, in the WA State Parliament? But, yeah, so she was coming again from that conservative side of politics. Exactly. Not from the left of politics, for sure. Yeah. And then there was also Florence Cardell Oliver, who became the first woman to achieve full cabinet rank in, in Australia in 1947. So... And then on top of that, there was also the first female senator, Dorothy Tangney. There's also a seat named after her, not too far from where I live, actually, and it'll be a key seat at the upcoming federal election, which we've got to win back. So look, there's plenty there that we can give ourselves a pat on the back. But I will add on this, Georgie, it will not be directly relevant to the history side of things that we're discussing on this podcast, but there still is a long way to go. And I think that we need to do more to encourage good quality women to participate in centre-right politics. Well, it's an amazing foundation to build upon these liberal leagues and, the, as you say, the Australian Women's National League becoming quite a force to build up women through the 20s and 30s and 40s and put them in positions where they are running for office and getting elected to office. And as you say, I mean, Edith Cowan, she's got a uni after her, Dorothy Tangy, a seat named after her. These are legends in the pantheon of Australian politics. So, Sherry... If we get to the early 1940s and the United Australia Party across Australia is foundering and floundering, the 1943 election basically ceases to exist and, of course, Robert Menzies and others start to make moves to form this new political party. What is going on in WA at that time politically that lends itself to be part of this movement? Yeah, what's going on, it's a very interesting question because we're right in the middle of World War II and then we had that very big, the 14 points referendum. And this is when Menzies over East and, and others locally in WA uh, start to scratch their heads and start to sort of say that we need to have an organised centre-right movement. And I suppose this is where we can probably spend a little bit of time talking about some of the people, the personalities involved who helped to put it all together from a WA point of view. That's right. So who were the key figures who were involved at this time? Because of the scarcity of resources covering this specific period, specifically in A and WA, I have had to rely, so for the first part of my research for this book chapter that I've written for you, I had to sort of rely on a lot of what I could find in newspaper archives, as well as conversations I had with party elders in Western Australia. So they always remind me that it wasn't all down to Jim Patton or Ross McClarty and Ross MacDonald. There was other figures as well, like Frank Downing and Don Cleland, who played a pretty big role in mobilising 
centre right sentiment in Western Australia, and they and featuring in the Unity Conference in October and on 844. So Jim Patton, obviously, from my own research, strikes me as a fairly central figure. So we can talk a little bit about him. He was those unsung heroes in WA's political history. Although he was a bloke from Tasmania and a World War One veteran who rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He did move to WA and that's where he made his mark as an accountant and a well-known community leader. He was into sport from what I'm told. He was a founder of the WA Surf Life Saving Association. He served as the president of the Chamber of Commerce. Now, he was in the 1943 election where Labor pretty much swept the board. Patton stepped up as a leader within the struggling Nationalist Party, which you were sort of talking about earlier. He became the party's president in 1944, wasn't just there to sort of hold the fort. He was there to really drive things and make things happen from the bottom up. And like I was saying before, one of the major reasons for his involvement in the 1944 powers referendum was that he felt very strongly about those issues. And WI narrowly voted yes. And Patton's work on the no campaign boosted his own profile and gave him valuable experience in political campaigning which led to him eventually becoming one of the founding pioneers, if not the central one, once the WA Liberal Party took shape. Well, he becomes the first Western Australian division president, doesn't he? It's interesting, He, when they were debating at the Unity Conference the name of this new political party, and he served on the Names and Objectives Committee, he wanted it to be called not the Liberal Party but the Freedom Party. Yeah, correct. Maybe that's a reflection of uh, part of that secessionist sentiment. We've spent quite a bit of time reflecting on perhaps I think he certainly did have some of those tendencies from the conversations I've had with party elders. So, yeah. In his some of his speeches, he does put a lot of emphasis on freedom of the individual. This freedom is the freedom that allows others equal freedom. It's freedom of religion, of thought, of speech, of movement, of choice, of occupation. So he's very driven by this core concept of freedom, which, yes, maybe it's a quintessentially Western Australian sentiment. I think it's a quintessentially centre-right thought. Personally, it's a, it's a classical liberal, conservative thought, power to the individual rather than power to the state. But yes, the sentiment finds itself manifest in a very interesting way perhaps affected by our odd geography and that very problematic relationship we've always had from the very beginning with other states and with the Commonwealth. But I think what really did help, though, was that the more I look at the what went on at the Unity Conference, the more I, I'm led to believe that that commitment to freedom, that predisposition towards freedom, was probably the number one driving force that actually bound all these disparate parties together and paved the way for the Liberal Party of Australia to emerge as we know it. How did the Liberal Party fare at the 1946 federal election then, Sherry? Obviously, it was very disappointing for the Liberal Party federally that formed this party in 1944, and there was great hopes that it might be able to wrest government from Labor's Ben Chifley in '46. but it founders, doesn't it? doesn't it succeed. Was it a bad result, particularly in WA? Yes, it was a particularly bad result in WA. And I guess this is where, because what happens is you go straight into the 1947 state election, which becomes the first change of government for the Liberal Party ever. So that quick turnaround is really, really interesting to talk about as well. If you, this is something you would like me to elaborate on now. Yeah, so tell me about, so the Liberal Party at a federal level in WA doesn't do so well in 46, and that must have been a real setback for Jim Patton and others. But in 47, the state election is held. Yes, it was a disappointing result for the nascent party, but then the quick recovery was made at that 47 state election. I mean, the party, from what I understand, was really smart about where it focused its efforts and resources. The party didn't try to compete in every seat. They concentrated on the ones that they had a real chance of winning. This meant that they could pour their resources into a few key areas where particularly the ALP incumbents were retiring and it really paid off. They also had new generation of candidates, a lot of whom were ex-servicemen. So the younger, fresher-faced candidates brought a lot of energy to the campaign and that really resonated with voters who were looking for change after the war. Another big factor was something we touched on earlier, which is the 
cooperation with the country party. So the Liberals worked quite closely with the country party exchanging preferences and critical seats. And I suppose that that kind of that cooperation was essential in those days, especially in WA, where the electoral system, you know, heavily favoured rural areas and the tight preference flows is what sort of tipped the balance in the end. But one other point I, I should probably add also is that you've got to remember that by 1947, Labor had already been in power for 14 odd years at the time. And there was this sense they'd become a bit complacent. And so that the centre-right, the Liberals, capitalised on this by focusing its campaign on critiquing the state's record and particularly its weak submission to centralising federal power, which is a big issue at the time. And the Liberals also tapped into the growing sentiment against centralism, sort of calling for states to take back income tax, which, as obviously, as we'd all know, used to be a state domain, but then income tax was made into a federal domain. It still remains there to date, which has kicked off some very interesting young Liberal debates back in the day, I remember bringing income tax power back to the states. So, yes, so those sort of the the broad factors that led to that 1947 win. And that must have really buoyed the hopes for the 49 federal election, of course, for the Liberal Party. So the Liberal Party wins in 1949. In terms of the party's role in government at a state level and at a federal level, how important has that been for the Western Australian resources boom, which of course has brought great prosperity to the West, particularly from that 1960s period onwards, because this is when there were important policy decisions taken at a federal level, lifting the ban on iron ore exports, the issuing of mining licences throughout Australia for iron ore and bauxite and the like, uranium. So this is a really, really critical time for states like Western Australia that are so reliant on the resources industry for their economic development. Yeah, so I think everything that has occurred throughout the 50s, the 60s, the 70s onwards to the present day is essentially a protracted consequence of that early win in 1947, the first ever for um, the modern WA Liberal Party, and then at the federal level in 49. There's no doubt the party deserves a lot of credit for fostering this boom. It was under leaders like Sir David Brand and Sir Charles Court, the Liberal Party actively sought to attract foreign investment, which was critical for kickstarting the mining industry in WA. For instance, Sir Charles Court, the father of Premier Richard Court, who served as a resources minister from 1959 to 1971 and then as Premier from 74 to 82, was instrumental, as you just mentioned, in lifting the embargo on iron ore exports, which is the backbone of WA's economy and the backbone of of Australia's economy in, in some respects. That was a bit of a game changer for the state's economy and I guess the Liberal Party's commitment to free enterprise was also a big factor. The development of the Pilbara region, for instance, was done in partnership with private enterprise, reflecting the party's belief in the power of the market to drive growth and prosperity. This approach helped WA to develop its resources industry without relying too heavily on government intervention. And I guess the other point worth noting is that it wasn't just about mining. The Liberal Party's long-term vision for economic development also included major infrastructure projects that were essential for supporting the state's growth. So Charles Court, for instance, played a key role in establishing the Northwest Shelf Natural Gas Project, which became a cornerstone of WA's economy. But I guess it's not just about that. I mean, Liberal Party values even today continue to shape WA and the state's you know, strong focus on economic freedom, individual enterprise, minimum government interference can all be traced back to the Liberal Party's core values that have been championed over the years. And a strong stance on state rights and is rooted deeply in that philosophy of decentralisation and local governance. So definitely, I think it's had a, a big impact on the mining boom here yeah, locally. Yeah, and the development of the agricultural industry, of course, through the Ord River Irrigation Scheme and DAM. These were big projects that really provided the right infrastructure in place to develop that key component of Western Australia's economy. 100%, as Premier Barnett always likes to remind us, and Richard Court before him. Yep, absolutely. And I guess I'd probably wrap up by saying that it was really sad to see in uh, 2021 what happened to this great party that we've spent those past 45 minutes to an hour discussing, and I really hope that we're able to turn things around at, <laughs> on the 8th of March next year. 
Well, fascinating history of the development of the Liberal Party in Western Australia, but politics in Western Australia, because it is distant for us out east here, over east, and it's also not, a, I think, a familiar story. So thank you so much, Sherry, for bringing it to us. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I'm always happy to have a conversation. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook.